Welcome back, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you support this venture, you could head over to patreon.com slash tawahado. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash tawahado. You can also join the YouTube channel directly at various levels, even $1 a month. My special guest today is my friend Lij Tadla Malaku, as well as my very distant cousin. <laughs> Uh, and maybe we'll talk about that one day. Um, he is a philosopher. He's also a lover of languages, particularly the languages that I love. And he's an established author of two books. Welcome to the program, Lich Tedla. Thank you very much. Uh, um, it's an honor uh, to speak with you because I know how you think, uh, you know, and also, uh, because you are uh, a philosophy uh, student, uh, majored in philosophy, studied philosophy. So this is going to be very interesting. Yeah, good at you, fella. So I'm going to warn people in advance. Lijtadla and I have many, many topics that we can talk about, and we're going to talk about a lot down the line. This one is a touchier subject. So this is as much as a trigger warning as you're going to get. If you're squeamish in any way, run away now. This is for people who are interested in pursuing the truth. My alma mater had the motto that the truth has nothing to fear from investigation. And that is something that I affirm. And I know my brother uh, affirms that as well. I'm going to set it up a little bit and I'm, I'm going to throw it at you. So I had read... Uh, what the kind of most popular guest on this program years ago, Curtis Yarvin had wrote, and he wrote about this interesting situation between the one of the geneticists par excellence, really of all time, that helped discover the double helix, James D. Watson, who had a conversation with Henry Gates. I have also listened to this conversation between the Black American or the ADOS, African descendant of slaves, uh, Glenn Lowry, famous uh, economist, and the linguist John McCorder have a similar conversation. I've also come across the famous probabilist Nassim Taleb, and also an Orthodox Christian's take on on IQ, what he what he would call uh, largely a pseudoscience. He didn't say entirely, but he said largely. And so the, the the kind of big topic is this idea people talk about race, even going across languages, you know, these concepts don't have direct word for words. In our Amharic, we have zar, which, you know, in its most literal sense means seed, just like the Hebrew and, and the Greek in, in the scriptures, when they talk about people's offspring or descendants, they say so-and-so's seed. So let, let's start big picture. Uh, how, how did you begin to learn about this topic in general, in, in any shape, way, or form? Uh, a very um, good question. Well, uh, for me, it was um, it had always been um, a topic of interest um, uh, because I, you know, as I began to discover the world, you know, growing up, I noticed uh, that people had uh, differences in their obviously, like everyone, and not just in their appearances but in the way that they interacted with each other in the context of their appearances, which is very different than, for example, how people or people want to uh, generally uh, in society uh, want to um, define or uh, talk about uh, these issues, uh, things like race um, uh, and things like ethnicity and so on and so forth. But for me, it was uh, from the very beginning, uh, ever since, you know, I can, uh, you know, I, ever since I was little, uh, I could tell maybe it's nothing special, but in my experience, I could tell that it, it, it affected the way that people existed and carried themselves uh, in the world so and it's not it, it it's it was never just a matter of like skin color for example uh it was 
an entire worldview about um, mentality. Uh, and it hit, in my uh, perception, always been intertwined with um, the way that culture expressed itself everywhere. Even in things that we assume to be completely separate from race and from ethnicity, uh, things like uh, spirituality, for example. For example, in the Semitic cultures, it is said that um, religion and ethnicity are like the line between them uh, is blurry. Very, <laughs> very blurry. Yeah, it's it's blurry. And this is one good example where we assume that, for example, in spirituality, spirituality is very separate from um, the physical aspects of our existence, but it's not necessarily true. This is not to mean, by all means, this is not to mean that spirituality uh, and ethnicity uh, influence each other directly, but this is to say, or race, and we can define, you know, I mean, uh, maybe a sociologist would would want to define them differently, but like I, I personally define race and ethnicity uh, differently, but not so different. And there's a reason for that in my uh, understanding. So to uh, sort of focus on the issue. Now, we have to be very careful about certain things. For example, um, in the Christian or Judeo-Christian uh, uh, religious uh, traditions and understanding uh, or sacred history and also uh, revelation uh, or revealed knowledge as for example the scholastics would call it uh, the racial existence of man um, comes from uh, one source and from from a general unity so there's no separation in terms of uh, there's no um separation that defines human race in the same way that other kinds are defined kinds in, in terms of um other animals and other existences so um but when we focus on how people interact with each other in light of how they're perceived and how they perceive themselves, there is a truth that society does not want to face. And that truth is that there are differences, but these differences um, from an ethical point of view ought not to be differences that uh, need to be emphasized to the point of separation and isolation. Now, that's going to take us to a different conversation. But now, this is to say that I've always, I, I can, I mean, since the beginning uh, of my uh, life as someone who perceives and lives and interacts with uh, others in society and the structures of society, I've always seen, I've always understood the differences. And those differences were not uh, differences that um, that dehumanized um, any group, in my perception, in in and of themselves is what I mean, and not uh, uh, politics or um, other institutions, but or disciplines. But the differences mattered. That's important to understand. They mattered whether people accepted them or not, or whether people uh, understood them for what they are in and of themselves or not, they mattered in insofar as I understood them in the way that people interacted and the way that people felt about themselves, about the world, about humanity, and so on and so forth. So this is all to say that this is an important topic. <laughs> it's an important topic to the sense of, uh, to, to, um, 
in the sense that it's not when one talks about race or ethnicity, that doesn't mean racism or ethnicism, because th that becomes a philosophy with its own connotations or an ideology rather. But we can talk about race and ethnicity um, in general in order to try to understand what these things are. And because there are these things in people's minds and in the world, and also in reality, I'm more of an essentialist. I don't believe in social constructionism. And that's another problem when it comes to race and ethnicity, where you hear social constructionists who say that race is a social construct, that everything gender is a social construct, everything is a social construct. Well, everything is a social construct for the social constructionist. Uh, <laughs> That's also why social constructionists don't really like biology. They don't really like the hard sciences. No. Because the hard sciences have this sort of absolute truth about them that social constructionists and postmodernists don't like. So that's and, and, that's and that's a weird it's a weird point. People have noted a lot, you know, terms like left and right, they're they're, they've changed over time and people have used it in different ways. But loosely speaking, people used to think of, quote unquote, the right as uneducated, backwards traditionalists who are anti-science, especially anti-hard science. And then the reverse of the left was thought that the left was the most into science and rationalism because of the Enlightenment. And steadily over time, just like we've seen Democrats and Republicans switch over the issue of, of black people in the United States and states' rights, this, this left-right switch regarding the hard sciences, I think, has fully, fully changed by, by this point. And, and, and that, that's a very funny thing. I, I was not rooting for Donald Trump in 2016, and yet... I was delighted and I was laughing when he won, if only to rub it in the face of the social constructionist, because there's a, a linear view of history as always progressing towards their goals that happens. And that was a moment of rude awakening that I think reminds them more that history is more of a pendulum. And the pendulum I see is that I think if I'm being charitable to the social constructionists, what they saw was, I think, a, a right critique that people of the past had an, a, a sort of inaccurate essentialism. They jumped to their conclusions too quickly. Like they, they once thought there were six races, then they got down to three races. I think, you know, Negroid, Cockoid, Mongoloid by the end of it. And the kind of 20th century social constructionist anthropologists they reacted against that to the point where it says, well, no, everything is all made up. So I think they reacted too much in one direction. And it seems things are being corrected now in the other direction. From what I gather, and, and you could correct me where I'm wrong, I think you may have looked into this more than I have, from listening to the geneticist James Watson, listening to Henry Gates and the fumbling and unintelligible New York Times talk about a racism versus racialism, making words up, um, and listening to Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter and Nassim Taleb on this concept, what I understand is that we have some evidence via IQ and other metrics that would make us believe amongst population groups. I think you use the word race and ethnicity. I think I would lean towards, I've heard the, the uh, biologist uh, Brett Weinstein use this and I'm, I'm not opposed. Population groups would have differences and that there is a genetic component. I have no idea what percentage is genetic versus the kind of unadulterated culture or you know the nature nurture debate i don't know what the percentages are and i think that the iq tests don't say everything that people who usually promote them want them to say but it would be i think inaccurate to say that we have no knowledge or that there is zero evidence that the evidence is pointing in one direction but that further research needs to be done is that is that close at all or approximate your view of things? Yeah, here's here's the thing. Uh, I think that um, the hard sciences are helpful to the extent that, for example, uh, if you take forensic uh, 
uh, forensic science, uh, there's a 95% accuracy rate in um, understanding the quote unquote race of um, a skeleton. You know, for example, someone was murdered and they mm -hmm. can find, you know, the remains and the skull and the skeleton, the, the, the remains and understand the quote unquote racial background of this person. So what does that say? With a 95% accuracy rate. Now that's that's an important uh, that's an important fact. So this is not the, this is not something that we can ignore. Uh, that's one thing. Second thing, when these racial divisions that had occurred uh, in theory is what I mean uh, by uh, anthropologists or bioanthropologists, physical anthropologists from the uh, uh, from the past, uh, from the 18th 19th centuries up until the 20th uh, century they had observations even though they had biases they were they they had uh, racialist and racist uh, they had a well they had racist mentalities because that i wouldn't deny that person uh, mm -hmm. that could make another conversation uh, because it's obvious and uh, you know there's all the uh, um literary evidence for it for instance but we can separate the mentality from the observation that's what i want to make uh, where i want to draw a line so what's the observation that what are the observations that they were making for example uh there was um what social constructions would call pseudoscience uh a craniofacial anthropometry for example where they would uh, look at the skull right but this is this has nothing to do with like the you know uh, the size of the brain and the size of the skull where you know if your skull is bigger or smaller this is not what it's about it was never well that these measurements for example in uh, cranial facial anthropometry were not about um showing that a bigger skull was smarter or a smaller skull was dumber that's not what it was about was more trying to understand um, features, uh, facial uh, structure, and things like that, in order to best understand the different uh, uh, populations, uh, groups of people in the world, and how they relate to each other. You see, that was that's where it's more relevant rather than uh, that observation by itself separately. If if um, investigated separately is not it's it's not uh something without value it's the, the the observations had always been there for example xenophanes the philosopher uh um, from you know, uh, from the socratic uh, era uh <clears throat> was writing about uh, the ancient ethiopians for example when he talked about the ancient ethiopians uh, he wasn't necessarily talking about the current Ethiopia. He was talking about uh, what would today uh, would be called blacks or uh, black Africans, right? So he would make observations about their appearances and their facial features. And, and so it's not, it goes back in time philosophers thinkers uh, people who uh, are trying to study nature and trying to study uh, humanity are going to make observations just like you can make observations between the differences in the shapes of forms in general uh, shapes of uh, things in nature we're going to uh, start perceiving things uh, like the equal uh, for example like uh, 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 Plato and Socrates are talking about the, the equal, the concept itself, and then you have uh, you you're able to understand things in the way that they appear, and in the and how you perceive that through sense perception. So that should not be something uh, to be um, condemned because of. A social theory.
or or because of some kind of uh, ethical or moral formulation uh, from the postmodernist era, <laughs> you know. So it's not. It's just. I mean, it, it it's it's unbecoming in my. But we should be able to separate uh, conclusions about uh, uh, racial uh, supremacy or racial uh, mentalities that are completely unethical and that hurt humanity. These are bad. And and by, well, we're just using a buzzword here. But what I mean is these things are hurtful uh, uh, to society and to humanity in general. Now, when we try to shun away or uh, try to conceal how people perceive, it's the same um, it, it's like um, trying to impede uh, upon or trying to make someone say nothing or shut up about their feelings or their opinions. So what you're doing is you're you're taking away their chance uh, to negotiate their future and also to be able to interact with uh, society at large and to be able to express how they perceive because um, most or in my opinion most ideas uh, um, about how humanity in general and humans individually uh, understand the world is based on how they interact with the world through sense perception so and to try to regulate that to try to regulate how people perceive is completely counterproductive to progress um it is going to make interactions completely dysfunctional so this is why things like uh, you know, in the po- postmodernist era, radical social constructionism, <laughs> as I would call it right now, for example, and other far leftist uh, ideologies that have uh, established themselves in the disciplines, um, you know, and or in the way that uh, the, the, these um, social sciences have evolved and have grown has to do with reacting against, and this is also out of fear, not just out of uh, wanting to cohabitate and be able to live together. It's out of fear of a reality, a reality that could be interpreted a certain way. Now, any possibility of of reality as a whole should not be feared. It should be uh, the mentality towards it should be to to welcome it and to face it. But it's better to try to understand how the world is instead of trying to reduce meaning in general to how we would want it to be. So this is where the entire the racial now to some people it might seem like we're deviating or like (laughs) running away from the topic but we're not we're actually delving deep into it so what i'm trying to say in simple terms for example is that these topics like society would heal in my opinion as a whole humanity in general uh, would heal from from many illnesses that came about uh as a result of dysfunctional uh, discussions or dis- d- dysfunctional interactions because of fear, because of um, hatred, and also uh, because of trying to conceal and trying to suppress uh, uh, opinions based on uh, perception and perspe- perspective in general. Uh, but I'd rather I'd rather say perception in this. Uh, so uh, go from there. But, but Antaru, no, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I think you may laugh at this, but this is 
what I think is actually the most American part of me. And the reason I say that is because I have this desire, or maybe it's, you know, pre-American, but I have this desire to confront rather than to run away from the fears. And to give a silly example, I like to take daily cold showers. And the reason I like to do that is because no matter how many times I've done that, I've done it for like two years, there's this fear I have of the cold water and confronting it makes me feel like I have at least one small achievement unlocked or one accomplishment of the day. And like you said, it leads to a greater feeling. Why I say it's the most American, although it could be pre-American, we'll, we'll judge that later, is in Ethiopian culture, there's this long history of court intrigue that is amongst the clergy, the aristocracy, and the, the king, and the king of kings. And within that culture, we have sayings such as rather than the food item or the quality of the food, I care about how the presenter's face looks. I care about the presentation. And so the, the kind of Anglo-Saxon saying of functionality over form is flipped in the Amharic saying of form over function, or if I could redefine it, relationship or the protection and keeping of the feelings and the honor of somebody or some group of people, since we're talking about population groups, versus the reality or the facts. And so there is, I think you would admit, this, this undeniable part of our society that you and I are a part of that wants to, you know, um, if I was being impolite, it would be like lie to somebody so that they feel better about themselves. And yet we think ultimately in the long term, uh, maybe putting the truth down with a little bit of medicine, the way we've been doing it. You know, you, like you said, we're not dodging the subject. We're we're trying to give the people a little bit of, of medicine, a little sugar to make the medicine go down. Um, but yeah, what it, if you could comment briefly on what you think of this kind of, at least one strain of Ethiopian thought that says, try to like protect the relationship of feelings, you know, fitu kafut fitu yilik isha lo al isha. You're on mute right now, brother. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, when it comes to Ethiopian uh, uh, culture and proverbs and, and sayings, uh, it, it's so uh, profound that obviously, like you already know, uh, we we have like gold and uh wax <laughs> where you know wax is like the um, literal meaning or you know what you think but then the gold is the hidden meaning uh the real deal <laughs> the real meaning so now the mentality uh, uh in ethiopian culture well when i say ethiopian culture I mean, uh, the culture of historic Ethiopia is what I'm talking <laughs> about. <laughs> Not modern Ethiopia, because modern Ethiopia is unrecognizable to me personally. Yeah. So, but historic Ethiopia, um, there was no, uh, I mean, integrity mattered so much that um, everything, there, there's no sugarcoating in it, but there's trying to protect out of politeness, out of politeness, trying to protect um, the general psyche uh, of, uh, of individuals within society. Like psychologically, uh, there's no fragility or fragility is not tolerated in a sense in, in, in society or societally, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in in um, historic Ethiopia, rather, because that was the only way that, you know, uh, you could aggressively survive threats. For example, religious threats, uh, uh, Ethiopia was, uh, and otherwise, surrounded historically by a very powerful empires from all sides 
Um, and in order to survive that, not only do you have to be uh, very faithful, <laughs> but you also have to be able to to be what you call, for example, there's a personality trait uh, called agreeable. Mm -hmm. You have to be disagreeable. You know, you have to extremely be, disagreeable. Extremely disagreeable. So that's the only way that you can survive. You know, and that that mentality became um, a national tr uh, trait, <laughs> you know, uh, like to be disagreeable. Uh, and to the point that like words like yawah, you know, you know what that word means, right? Obviously you do. Um, yeah, innocent or meek. Meek, you know, became synonymous. So innocent, innocent right? became synonymous with, well, uh, with, um, like, someone who's not, uh, <laughs> how do you say this? <laughs> someone An who's idiot. not old. An idiot, yeah. <laughs> like, like, they look down on you if you're innocent, which sounds funny in English, to say it in English. Exactly, but this is not to say, this is not to say that they're bad people. It's not like that. But it's because of the consequences of being meek in that society. It was because of, you know, ev every enemy is encroaching upon the kingdom. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a critique before these schools are even verbalized. It is a it is a national it is an Ethiopian national critique of the political school of idealism. Absolutely. Yeah. So. <laughs> so now the meaning of that, the meaning of that in in Ethiopia's historical historic Ethiopia's society, the way that uh, individuals and uh, uh, families and and uh, people in general interacted uh, amongst each other in that society was very very profoundly aggressive at the same time, sophisticated and very perceptive of reality and how things are. Now, this created, for example, the context of race. This is why I think, in my opinion, one of the reasons that uh, uh, society, uh, our society, well, now suffers, uh, suffers. One of the reasons for this, in my opinion, is that although um, Ethiopians understood because of religion, because of spirituality, Ethiopians understood the importance uh, of not focusing on on racial identity and uh, and racial, you know, like the unity of uh, humanity and values and um, religious values and faith. But what's important to know in terms of the consequences of reality as of, you know, the reality of yesterday uh, and the consequences of that uh, today, you know, and how people are living and interacting with each other. In their deep psychology, or you can say subconsciously, there's an understanding. There's an understanding of, um, even though it's not directly expressed, uh, the Habesha identity, for example, um, the Habeshas would um, identify as a certain race in society outside of their own today, but then within themselves, <laughs> they identify as their own thing. And then not only that, but then when they interact with the race that they identify as, in the outside world, when in the conversation within themselves, they're treating it as the I and the other. So now this is not this. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because it, it's telling of something. This is not hatred or people are going to completely misunderstand this. And this is why it's important. This is it's not self-loathing. It's not hatred. It's not mere ethnicism. It's not tribalism. 
it's not racism, then what is it? Then what is it? Now, that's the question. Well, it's an understanding of, of uh, one's ancient origins. <laughs> that's really all it's about. It's it's not about it's it's not about a uh, a, a constructed um, hateful opinion and or or s some false imagery about the self. It's not. What really is it? It's without knowing in detail. Because, you know, the level of understanding in terms of the sciences and the history uh, of, uh, of uh, the people, too little is understood and very little is known amongst the people themselves, let alone the outside world, when it comes to who the Habashas are. And I'm using the Habashas as an example. But then there's this uh, deep subconscious understanding, <laughs> call it understanding or awareness of one's ancient origins. Not just the um, origin story, for example, uh, told or, or this or that, but there actually is, there really is, um, you know, someone who's never heard, uh, you know, in that from that community, never heard any of these historical stories or anything. Upon interacting in the world with others, ethnic others, for example, or racial others, for example, is going to immediately position him or herself in a place mentally that makes them see the other in a very specific way. And that very specific way is revealing of not that person's identity, but one's own identity. I don't know if I'm making any sense right now, but like, yeah. are you following? Yeah. So the reason that I'm saying this is that I think that this has been my observation of when it comes to you know the Habesha experience, but then obviously when you deep uh, delve deep in uh, uh, into the history and so on, you're going to understand why. <laughs> you're going to understand why, and it becomes immediate clear. Yeah, because I think this even... is where we. I think this is where we can uh, segue it. So, I always believe in you know steel manning, which is the opposite of straw manning, which is to say being as charitable as possible to your opponents. We have listed as our intellectual opponents the the, the hyper-progressivism or the, the people who are believing everything is 100% a social construct. We haven't delineated what percentage you know goes where, but we know it's not 100%, and we, we know that's the case. And we're indiscriminately following and pursuing the, the evidence wherever it is that it's going to lead us. And in fact, James Watson, the geneticist, one of the things that he mentioned several times is wherever the evidence leads us, he believes in maybe if he has a, a kind of Anglican Christian past, this idea of uplifting whoever is less off due to these differences. It doesn't mean like, you, like you've mentioned several times, not to look down on in disdain or anything like that, but just, just to lay, lay out the trail and follow the evidence so a lot of people in this discussion are obsessed with trying to figure out why did Europe, you know, conquer the world or conquer, you know, the West, you know, especially, you know, North America with, with the indigenous populations. For me, that question is less relevant, but I'll pull upon one of the big authors that of that side, uh, Jared Diamond, right? And his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, he pretty much says it's 100% geography is his conclusion. And you look at Ethiopia, and one of the startling things about Ethiopia is that, and we're talking about historic Ethiopia, it contains 70% of the mountains of Africa. When I learned that, I said, wow, that's astounding, but that doesn't mean that it's everything. And I think it's certainly not that. And in fact, even the selection of terrain to live in 
can go back to some of the conversation we're talking about. James C. Scott is, um, I believe, either Princeton or Yale, one of these also brilliant people, most famous for the art of not being governed or seeing like a state, studying these stateless people called Zomians across eight Southeast Asian nation states who lived statelessly up to 100 million people, even in the 20th century before a bunch of spook wars out there took place. And his big insight is that the way nation states form is by people who have systems of writing and that systems of writing in our context, it relates to spirituality and religion as we talked about, but the, uh, the other kind of hidden meaning that he uncovered is that it allows people to keep records and collect taxes and thus build a more powerful security force and, and a nation state. And I say, wow, these are also factors. And then you have, someone like the Bronze Age pervert whose, whose book I've uh, reviewed on this channel, who's making a lot of um, hubbub in the news the past two, three years, An interesting character, who I think is a hyperbolic kind of satire, but believes at least in part what he's saying in terms of that the blood or the genetics is the most significant factor in, in these conversations. The question I would ask you, because we, we kind of touched on it briefly, is, can you tell my audience what is historic Ethiopia and what makes her so unique in, in the continent, in Africa? Excellent. Um, whew, that's, uh, that, <laughs> that's going to be a, that's good. That's going to be a tough one as well. I mean, because of how vast of uh, and profound of a topic it is in, in my opinion. Um, well, here's the thing. Um, when we talk about Ethiopia, we're talking about um, geographically where, you know, Ethiopia is now, right? So on the map. But when we go back, uh, say, 4,500 years, um, around uh, 2,500 B.C., that's, you know, that's the time that, um, according to uh, local sources at least, and also supported by uh, the history of uh, Punt, for example, where things begin uh, with continuity, without uh, um, seizing. So, now, what's very important to know here is that the people who live there are uh, and who've lived there since since ancient times, since the time that uh, I mentioned, have been intermixing with world populations for a very long time. So the term uh, the term Abyssinian, for example, which is uh, uh, which is Latin for uh, Habashite or Khipsi in, in some sources. Um, this this um, identity in that region has been around for a very long time and by some scholars is believed to be the uh, where Semitic languages actually uh, were birthed. That's and not right. just yeah and it's not just um it's not just that um, uh, now according to old sources that i i could mention some of them um, wait, um well there's one old source uh called the cyclopedia of uh, useful knowledge That dates uh, back to the nineteenth uh, century, so eighteen hundreds. Talks about how, for example, the Himyarite, uh, the Himyarite kingdom uh, of Yemen, was directly linked. The Menaeans, the Sabaeans, the Chaldeans, all these people, uh, and uh, also, you know, the very ancient uh, civilizations that lived in. Uh, 
Mesopotamia, um, like, well, the Akkadians, for example, where uh, the Giz language uh, is uh, related to all these languages, the Amharic language, Ethiopia's um, official language for the past uh, seven, eight hundred years, at least, uh, since the time of um, Nikuno Amlak and since the time, uh, arguably since the time of Lalibela, the Zagwe dynasty. So, now, you have, uh, this is just for context, you have um, more languages, uh, uh, more, for example, more Semitic languages in Ethiopia than the entire Middle East combined, like all the uh, Semitic languages in the Middle East combined. Now, the living languages. So what does that say? Now, that's one thing. The second thing is Egypt and Sudan. When we talk about uh, the history of Egypt and Sudan, it's all important to also talk about the history of Ethiopia because of how interrelated they are. Now, an archaeologist by the name of uh, Jean Dorès uh, has said this, um, not just because of the Nile River, which um, the Blue Nile, which starts in Ethiopia and you know flows through Sudan and Egypt, not just that, but also um, ancient historians, for example, like um, uh, uh, Diodorus, uh, for example, um, said that it in the ancient world it's it, it was understood or believed that ancient Egypt was founded by ancient uh, Ethiopian uh, kings, and that these ancient Ethiopian kings were later deified and made into uh, into God. For example, Osiris, right? So if you take Osiris, um, uh, the name itself, there's an equivalent of that uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, uh, um, and that's uh, Asir, Asir. For example, and you have a uh, uh, Wakshum, uh, king of uh, the Zagwe uh, line, for example, named Osiris, <laughs> is like Asir, and other many many uh, uh, traits like that. But now, when we talk about ancient Ethiopia, what's very important is to understand that Ethiopia interacted with the entire Middle East. Ethiopia interacted with the superpowers of ancient times um, had uh, direct links uh, through, you know, trade, uh, through um, uh, 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 not just economic, but also, you know, religion and other cultural. So in order to try, in order to understand the um, ancient world, Ethiopia is a country that's important to use as a tool where people are not, uh, for example, archaeologists are not necessarily uh, uh, focusing on that area to understand uh, the Middle East, for example, whereas um, had they focused on Ethiopia, and I'm dead sure uh, <laughs> about this, well, obviously, people could say that it's just an opinion, but, and they've already found things, for example, that were shocking, uh, like the um, uh, Illuminated manuscripts, for example, and uh, the Garima Gospels. Yeah, the, the Garima Gospels, and recently there was a entire church uh, from early <laughs> Christianity, uh, from from the earliest times of uh, Christ. Well, not earliest, but like you know, uh, three hundreds uh, uncovered in Aksu, just recently. Uh, that was like last year. Um. You have a 3,000-year-old temple, Sabaean temple at Yeha. You have, um, you have pre-Aksumite uh, lion uh, statues like Ambasadungai in, in the Amhara region, where, in, well, currently the Amhara. Well. So these artifacts are directly related with the history of Ethiopia's, uh, well, contemporary kingdoms at the time, when Ethiopia was uh, 
was an important uh, uh, empire or kingdom and was interacting with these other kingdoms. And there was, um, through that interaction, exchange of, you know, culture, and not just culture, but also genetic and racial uh, intermixture throughout the, you know, and not just centuries, but thousands of years. So Ethiopia is really full of it. So the entire, um, you know, history from 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 ancient Egypt, from um, uh, ancient Mesopotamia, from the Levant, ancient Israel, Palestine, uh, you know, Sabaeans, the Menaeans, uh, you know, um, uh, all these groups in the Sudan, Nubia, all these groups, and Ethiopia is right there at the center, at the bottom center. So all these ancient um uh peoples and their history kind of like intermix and you can find that in the uh genetic makeup and also in the culture in the expressions in the mentalities in um in the traditions uh and so on and so forth of ethiopians today uh, you know, because of how, and that and geographically, that area, the Red Sea, um, it's a portal, uh, you know, for, for the Middle East, that's uh, how you get into uh, uh, in, into that part of Africa. And it was in the news recently with that giant cargo ship that made it stuck. So people had to go all around Africa. The whole world <laughs> realized how important the Red Sea was with that whole fiasco. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, the Red Sea was, Red Sea is just historically very, very important place. Uh, biblically very important place. Uh, and also because it's literally the, what separates the African continent from the Middle East and from the Asian continent. Well, when I say the Middle East, I shouldn't say that is the Asian continent, because the Middle East is not a continent, it, technically, and it's a technical term, uh, it's a new term, Rel relatively. <laughs> yeah. And so, especially the, the Nassim Taleb crowd wants to separate the Levant from the Middle East and say either the Near East or the Eastern Mediterranean as its own sort of entity. Yeah. Uh, yes. And now, here's another thing, uh, since you mentioned the Levant, um, and you know, about 10 years ago, I think, there was a research on uh, Ethiopian genetics where uh, a group of uh, geneticists, uh, uh, scientists and re uh, researchers, uh, their names are uh, Luca Pagani, Professor Luca Pagani uh, from Cambridge University, I think, and also uh, Dr. Sarah Tishkov uh, from one of... Uh, uh, the universities uh, here in the U.S. were researching. Uh, it was one of uh, the most uh, relevant uh, and uh, serious uh, studies on Ethiopian uh, genetics, where they found that uh, Ethiopians have ancestry from the Levant from 3,000 years ago, which they said is consistent with the story uh, of, um, you know, those uh, Solomon and uh, King Solomon uh, and uh, the Queen of Sheba. Well, people could say that, you know, King Solomon, Queen of Sheba, that's, you know, biblical uh, um, stories, but well, it's a sacred history, sacred history. And the fact that um, scientifically there's something that actually backs that up is very fascinating in my opinion now the other thing is the sabaeans the sabaeans are a very important uh, aspect of ethiopian history just like the kushites uh or you know the the, the uh, uh, cushitic people have lived in that area for a very long time but there was an entire cushitic dynasty uh, in the sudan but then 
there was an Agassian dynasty in Ethiopia, which is uh, a, a Semitic uh, speaking uh, dynasty. And that, that dynasty is the dynasty, well, according to Ethiopian history, understood to be the dynasty of the Sabaeans. Now, new historians um, tried to make a separation between, uh, tried to isolate uh, the Sabaean history to Yemen, you know, and, uh, and separate it from, from Ethiopia. But when we look at uh, the artifacts in, uh, in northern Ethiopia, that date back uh, to 3,000 years uh, ago, or around 1,000 BC, 900 BC or so, incense burners, like temples, like uh, uh, Yaha, for example, and other artifacts as such. They're, I mean, the uh, alphabet, the writings are in Sabaean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's no denying that. And also the artifacts themselves are uh, obviously Sabaean uh, <laughs> monuments and uh, and statues and artifacts. So now the fact that science could discover that Ethiopians have, well, modern Ethiopians have a direct connection to uh, the ancient uh, people that lived in the you know the the Levant uh, the uh, today's Israel Palestine area, and that they could trace it back to three thousand years ago, genetically, and that the Sabaean kingdom actually encompassed uh, northern Ethiopia as well as Yemen. When you add it all up together, mm -hmm. um, I think that it it not only does it tell you something about the veracity of uh, Ethiopia's historical legends, but it also says something about biblical legends in general. Uh, so it's it's greater than just you know Ethiopia's uh, uh, identity. Uh, it's it's this is why Ethiopia's Ethiopia's history is a world heritage. It's not just uh, you know, uh, it, it's extremely global uh, in its um, extension. You know, so uh, yeah, I think I should. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the, right. So I think the 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 big kind of picture there that you're saying is you have these very ancient Semites, which some other people. You know, it, it's funny, as an aside, there's uh, one of my Twitter friends is a professor, Ahmed Al-Jalad, and he seems to be the world's leading Sephatic scholar. Sephatic is another one of these ancient kind of pre-Islamic Arabics or something like that. And what's fascinating is it, there's no script that you could write it in a phone. So when he writes the inscriptions he's looking at on Twitter, he writes them in an emoji, not an emoji, but a, a font that is South Sabaean. And by virtue of it being a South Sabaean font, I have no idea what the language is, but just like I could read German without knowing what German is because it's the same alphabet as English, there are many of the letters that are exactly the same as our alphabet. And so I, I regularly encounter that Sabaean connection that you've mentioned. But so it's this, this globally connected Semitic population which you said has mixed with a lot of people. And, and these are linguistic titles, but I think they, they relate to the population groups we're talking about. They have had this great admixture for centuries, if not millennia, with uh, various Cushitic populations. Like you were talking about earlier, how some of the, the Greek writers would just speak loosely when they say Ethiopia, sometimes referring to the Cushites of, of Nubia, the region between Egypt and Ethiopia, which is part of Sudan, but at various points in history was a part of the Ethiopian empire or a part of the Egyptian empire, kind of a, a no man's land in between those two greater historical empires. And the, the main Kushite strand or group in Ethiopia that, that Semites probably mixed with are certainly the Ago, 
Yaakov, you mentioned one of the the Lasta line, the, the Wagshum, and and that lineage. Later, though, after many centuries, especially since the 1500s, from the Oromo expansion, you have a lot of admixture with the Oromo, especially for uh, people uh, who have a lot of family in in Shoa, which is one of the historic uh, states or provinces of Ethiopia. I mean, it's it's really undeniable to the point where you know. Uh, some people from Gwandar will put their nose at some people at Shoa, kind of confusing the blob of the Amhara region that is one of the regions in the, in the modern politics. You know, I, I uncovered this this letter I translated and it got a, a little bit baby viral, let's say, because it was this funny letter of his uh, Imperial Majesty Emperor Minilik II, and he is rebuking. Abba Jafar II, who's an Oromo king who's assimilated into the into the Ethiopian monarchical system, because he's capturing slaves from this place called Janjiro. And these Janjiro are, I don't know what their, you know, their admixture is, but I'm I'm certain it's neither even uh, it's probably not even Cushitic uh, or or Semitic. It might be Omotic or Nilotic. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but he's capturing people from there. And I've, I've read about that place. You know, it's where even in the early 20th century, cannibalism and, uh, you know, outright extinction of, of people with any sort of paralysis was, was regular in that region. So he kind of dehumanized them and would capture them as slaves. And Menelik is rebuking them. He's like, he uses the same, the same you know, outlawed word, Galla to refer to both of them, but he he says, for him it's just kind of heathen or non-believer, and it's not specific to any particular ethnic group. He says, if you two can't get along, what's wrong with you? Look at how me, the Shoan king, and the Gondarin aristocracy are getting along. And so, not too long ago, Emperor Minilik is really not that long ago. He's talking about how there's this vast gulf between Gondar and Shoa and how impressed Abad Shavar should be with, with how he's getting along, let, let alone the kind of greater population differences. One of the, the modern issues the Amhara have been, have been uh, reaching is on these borderlands of what used to be, you know, Gwandar and Gwedjam, uh, what where Theodros arose from, Emperor Theodore arose from the kind of Quara region and below, which borders Sudan, there are many different Nilotic groups for whom that border is a lot looser than we would like it to think in the 21st century. And a lot of these people have lived on both sides, in the South Sudan side as well as the Ethiopian side. Uh, and some of the, the Beni Shangul people are some of the examples of that. But the, the Gambela, the Aniwak, and the Noar are also examples of kind of, I think that covers the kind of three, I would if I had to list three major groups, Semitic dominant, but mixed with Cushitic, Cushitic dominant, maybe some pure Cushitic, but probably not with, with some mixture of Semitic and then some sort of Nilotic or Omotic. Is that, is that kind of cover the, the big population groups of, yes. of Ethiopia? I, I would definitely uh, think that those, uh, uh, you know, because it's, when you say Semitic, it encompasses like many different uh, uh, groups and yeah. Nilotic, so definitely. Now, some people would, uh, for example, challenge the idea that the term Semitic Cushitic uh, could refer to, uh, uh, you know, a sort of like pan ethnicity, but, um, you know, they want to. Um, just use these terms to uh, refer to language. Personally, I disagree. Uh, I think uh, that ethnicity or uh, also race, technically, uh, and language are directly linked. Uh, you know, and when I say that, I'm not saying that uh, <clears throat> you cannot be obviously a person. You and I are not Anglos but we're speaking English. That's not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is uh, your, your, um, if your language is original to you and it's a Semitic language, for example, it shows that you're originally a Semite. 
that's more of the logic in simple terms. Yeah, and because Amharic, some... as you mentioned, has been the official language for 800 years. That doesn't mean everyone who spoke Amharic, that was originally the language of their peoples. Because there was a, a way in which the Ethiopian Empire was <clears throat> was highly not obsessed with genetics in this in the sense of obviously obsessed with genetics in the sense of the selection of the executive branch right the king of kings but not obsessed with it in terms of the way i just described emperor minelik and we could talk about how emperor minelik's mother is not semitic either is is some form of uh <clears throat> one of the, the the southern peoples but the way in which the 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 empire or the kingdom was assimilatory it, it it allowed people to enter as long as they identified with that culture and and language to to your greater point of it was not used to put people down but to include them in in the the greatness and the achievement the kind of excellence that they had established yes um and uh, i mean they also never um never viewed uh, their identity as something to to be imposed on others but rather something useful for for the unity of um, all the subjects of the empire and and that identity was best expressed not only in uh, the language, but also um, in faith, uh, for example, and other traditions that are directly linked to that. For example, the procession of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, that was extremely central uh, to the um, imperial uh, life and, and, and uh, worldview, as well as mission the entire mission of you know for example the dynasty itself uh, what it was about if you it, it's directly linked to the language for example M the amharic language is known as the lisan and august which means the tongue of the kings i love that phrase i use it all the time <laughs> yeah, it's the tongue of the kings so what does that mean it's the tongue of the solomonic dynasty it's the tongue of uh, that entire uh, mission and worldview uh, that based it, itself from the beginning on 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 these ancient Israelite <laughs> uh, biblical uh, uh, you know that are uh, simply not understood in our time. They're not understood. I mean, people watch documentaries about them. They watch, uh, uh, you know, they read about them. Uh, um, preachers talk about them. Uh, historians talk about them. But then the Ethiopian experience is completely different. The Ethiopian experience is comparable to, and this is, in my opinion, obviously, but as someone who has experienced this directly, um, when you understand what the Tabot is, it's like going back 3,000 years. It's when, you know, the <laughs> ululation, for example, in Hebrew, it's called Tzahalulim, right? It's like... Uh, uh, <laughs> exactly. That's, that's very uh, Solomonic. That's like from that time, from the Davidic time. Um, you know, when uh, the Ark comes out, carried by the uh, Levite uh, uh, protectors. That's how the ancient Israelites were. They were wearing the Talat, Talit, and, uh, you know, the uh, Tzazat, you know, like the Tzitzit, that's what they call it in Hebrew now. <laughs> you know, the, you know, the uh, way they're dressed and everything, and, and, um, the ululations and, and just the entire tradition. So now when you understand what this is, that's how you're actually looking at, you know, what was described in uh, Samuel, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the times of David, still here, you know, um, still here today because of the dynasty, because the dynasty 
the dynasty is one of the oldest continuous dynasties in the world. Well, it's uh, no longer functional. Uh, it was deposed in 74. But because it survived as long as it did, this tradition also survived. Well, someone could say that it's also because the church survived. Well, yes, but the church survives everywhere else, but not the tradition, not this tradition. You see, the church uh, in different uh, parts of the world, you know, the Orthodox Church, uh, for instance, uh, lives and uh, continues to. But this is separate. I mean, it's part and parcel of, of that Orthodox identity for, for the Ethiopian experience. Um, but it's, it, it, it's because of the continuity of that identity and tradition. It's because of how Christianity was uh, introduced to this specific people, the specific, you know, the Ethiopian uh, Abyssinians ha had this identity before that time. So because they had carried it with a dynasty, with an entire mission and an entire civilization based on that, that's why it survived for as long as it did. So That's right. It, it, it had pushback during Emperor Caleb's time, the Sassanid Empire, the Persians, pushed us out of Yemen, made us return back to the continent. We had Yodit Gudit, the either Jew or pagan queen, that tried to get rid of us. We had, much later on, the united forces of Ottoman Turks, of Yemenis, and of the Adal Sultanate, modern day Harar and, and Somali. And later after that, we had the Kingdom of Italy, and then we had Fascist Italy. And yet, through all of these attempts, Ethiopia remained intact. And if anything, the greatest ruin that Ethiopia has received is probably the ruin she brought upon herself from 1974 until the current moment, which is crazy for us to, to think. It's like Thanos in the, in the Marvel Universe. The only person who could defeat Thanos was Thanos himself. And the only, the only <laughs> nation that could defeat Ethiopia was itself Ethiopia. Um, but <laughs> yep. what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you attribute that to? You attribute it to these Semitic dominant Kushites? Or what, what is it that you attribute the fact that we were unconquerable until we conquered ourselves? Well, here's the thing. Uh, I attribute it to... Um, I think spirituality has a place in this. A very profound and central place. Because um, it's it's how well there's no doubt that this empire was you know one of the four superpowers of the world you know in ancient times Manichaeus has has written about this uh in the second century i believe uh he said uh that uh, ethiopia's well Aksumite empire at at that time was one of the four greatest uh, empires of, of of the world so it's definitely was a very strong empire with very strong foundations because it had been around for so long it's it's an amalgamation of all these cultures that we talked about so it derives and takes all the best qualities you know from different kingdoms and uh, and different knowledge uh, uh uh sources so so because of all of that and because of how old it is and for how, how long it's been around um without and without uh, you know without being conquered like you said i understand that these things are you know so to speak uh, important but how are you able to uh, sort of um maintain this kind of a civilization, especially a civilization that 
uh, has faith and uh, spirituality as its as its core, uh, as its uh, core identity and and worldview, uh, because the entire the worldview of of this specific empire was based on it's. It, it wasn't just, for example, when you build um, um, a state or a government based on pure reason. You know, just uh, uh, you know, uh, philosophers. Uh, just like philosophers from the Enlightenment era, and also uh, philosophers uh, post uh, the scientific revolution, uh, philosophers like Descartes and philosophers like uh, Francis Bacon. So what's going to happen? And obviously philosophers like uh, uh, Locke. What's going to happen is that um the core of your governmental structure becomes pure uh, human understanding, in a way, and reason. And the functions of it are just, are very intricate, very intricate, but they're very um, um, construct of of human understanding of how the world works and what's best, and and uh, as they're understood by reason, you know, uh, human uh, rational cogitation, or however you want to say that. But a kingdom like that, yes, it obviously includes, you know, uh, you know, rationality and uh, thinkers, but it's. Uh, its mentality, uh, its mentality sub is very submissive to mysticism. So it's it's an empire that, as an empire, is mystic, <laughs> and uh, this is this is important. This is because because this is how uh, uh, you know the Ethiopian Empire perceived itself and and lived. Uh, uh, or existed for so long. It's important. Uh, that's how it was, and that's how it uh, existed. So this is an important point to raise, in my opinion. So mysticism had a very important, well, orthodox mysticism. And when we say mysticism, obviously, we're not talking about new agey no, uh, no, stuff. No. <clears throat> that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, uh, this, you know, uh, the spiritual um it, it, well like earlier i mentioned revealed knowledge uh so knowledge that's known without knowing and also it, it's a kind of knowledge that's known without knowing through reason but but with with a level of certainty that is more certain that that under that the understanding of of the world through reason so it's not uh, it's a different kind of knowledge and it's not a knowledge that's acknowledged <laughs> by by uh, rationality in its own domain so yeah. rationality would not acknowledge that like a f philosophical thinking thinking would not directly see that as something reliable no, it's it's in a sense the opposite. It's irrationality. It's that disagreeableness that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. So it, it yeah. So, but but it's still important. It's important because because it was there, and it was it was the foundation and the core of the kingdom. So yeah. Wonderful. So this this talk i've i've enjoyed it if 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 people are not interested in it's funny because we're practicing the mysticism in itself in the esotericism of speaking about it and and i i know that's not for everyone and i delight in the fact that it's not for everyone because those who are pursuing this type of knowledge will be able to find nuggets of it and i think you and i it, it's so funny 
we, we met kind of at a pivotal moment, right? When we were reaching adulthood and uh, we met in, in Addis Ababa through great friends of the Lycée Gabra Mariam, the Lycée Francais Gabra Mariam. And we met in a time where we're evolving and learning. And even though we didn't see each other for a long time, like 10 years at a time, 10 years at a time, or 15 years at a time, we've seen each other like I think once in, in, the, in the midst of that actually in real life, but kept in touch kind of through social media. We've, we've been able to find this path, finding this balance between the rational and either the pre-rational or the irrational or the rational and the mystical and in, in terms of grabbing your legacy. Go ahead. I like pre-rational. <laughs> pre-rational. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's the because it, it's not it's not like you said, it's not the Kabbalah stuff of Madonna. It's uh, you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's it's what is there in history. Now, when we look at the history, when we look at the genetics of these population groups, when we study the movements, the connection in religion, politics, language, I mean, we've covered a breadth and a depth. To, to get out of the clouds and to dig our faces into the dirt, which is the, the practical grounded reality, which is how Semitics speak in the first place. Everything is based off not an abstraction like the Western philosophers, but a grounded reality. Why, why do you think it's important for you and I to have such a discussion? Why is it important to us to wake up these pre-rational and rational knowledge, which is the knowledge base of the Ethiopian empire? Well, that's, uh, that's a very good question. It's, well, in simple terms, because there would not be any other way to express it uh, or explain it. In simple terms, it's because um, the human reason and human um, and development based on that, and advance and progress based on that. It's 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 good aspect. It's it well the very good thing about it is that it disburdens man of uh, the condition of like of uh, suffering in the moment. But what it does is it reinforces. Uh, the suffer the inner suffer. So, so what happens is that um, on the long run, things are going to become more and more virtual. For example, and people are it's going to be a psychotic world in a way, you know, where where you know human interaction is going to be more altered more and more over time, and then our in, entire understanding of what we are and who we are is going to suffer. It's going to suffer. There's no doubt about that. And the only way out of that is through the inner self. And the inner self uh, uh, is not, uh, well, this is, now, when I say the inner self, I'm talking about that self which connects us all. And that self is not the I or the me, rather, um, uh, but uh, but the self would with a big S. Um, so it it's like when the prophet the uh, uh, prophet uh, Johannes uh, John. Well, he said he wasn't a prophet. I say he is <laughs> Saint John, right? Uh, well, he said what he. There's a phrase where he says, uh, he, he declines. And well, you're going to have to remind me of the exact sentence if you remember it. May I um, decrease well, and he increases? I, I decrease and he, exactly. I decrease and he increases. So that's mysticism. You see, now that's, that's what we're talking about. That's the only way out where, you know, the inner life. And the inner world of the person is filled with 
understanding that's beyond mortal reason and that's beyond um how we think and the ex well the extent of uh, uh how we can you know solve our problems you know so solve our solve our problems that are here right in our faces rather this is a more profound problem that we're solving um and it's the problem of suffering in the long term because the condition of mortality uh for example of man is faced directly no it's not something that you um hide or distract yourself from through technology or through entertainment and through uh the assumption of getting closer to immortality because of human abilities so now <laughs> i said i was going to put it in simple terms and i did not i did exactly the opposite without without uh, well it's still simple but what i mean is i said more than i should <laughs> should have you aimed <laughs> you aimed you aimed at yeah. simplicity you aimed at it whether we achieve it or not is going to be in the ear of the beholder um yes but it was it was your aspiration now this has been a great discussion i, I like i said you know we could we could hold you down and, and talk for 10 hours but we'll we'll keep this one shorter and we'll have you back to discuss many more topics that i think the audience will be excited about for people to reach out and learn more about these topics, you've written two books, one in English, one in Amharic. We can deep dive into them another time, but just to get their titles across now, in Amharic, Kubra Amhara, Yaman Nathachin, Amd, the honor or the glory of the Amhara, and it is the pillar of our identity. In English, you have reason and the sacred and Ethiopian metaphysics. Where can people find and, and purchase these books if they want to support your efforts and they want further reading on these subjects they can purchase them on amazon.com um, so just um, search the titles and or my name uh, Ted Lamalaku Lich Ted Lamalaku and, and I'll put the links in the show notes for people watching this on YouTube as well if they're watching it on Facebook they'll have to go to YouTube or they can do a little work on Amazon. Do you have any uh, any closing thoughts, anything you'd like to impart upon them uh, as a final word kind of on this, this subject of race, ethnicity, or population groups, however it is we're forming, forming them, and why we shouldn't, as you've said, and, and we've repeated, not shy away from these things, but, but learn about them. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, first I just want to say thank you for uh, inviting me in for 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 this amazing discussion really um and also i'd like to say that let us free ourselves from uh prejudice and from uh, uh, uh assuming that uh, you know certain terms mean certain things or or that certain uh, uh views are, are are to be categorized uh, in certain boxes let us try to understand things for what they are in themselves well it may not be possible to know things in themselves but when we try to understand things for what they are and not for what we assume that they are or what we want them to be because of fear or because of not wanting to face reality, then the problem with that is that even though it seems that we're solving the problem now by doing that, it creates a greater problem, a problem that's more more global and more social and more, like it, it creates more dysfunction uh, in the way that uh, uh, individuals interact and humanity. So that's all I have to say and thank you very much. Thank you for coming on the program, Lichtadlah.